Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our third webinar on financial wellness, sponsored by the NASDAQ Foundation. My name is Linda Williams. I am a community outreach and training manager with Consumer Action and your host for the day. And on behalf of Consumer Action Executive Director Anna Flores and the entire staff at Consumer Action, welcome. Welcome to the training. I am so excited about the conversation that we are about to have on investing in the digital age, building wealth through savings, and investing in your jobs 401k, that match savings program that consumers need to participate in. CNBC conducted a survey in 2021 and found that 17.5 million, 17.5 million Americans left free retirement money on the table. That has to stop. We're also going to have a conversation about why it's important for women and communities of color to invest, how to avoid risk, create financial habits, great financial healthy habits, and once they start investing. And audience, I can't think of two better people to have this conversation with than our guest speakers today. Joining us today is John Moses. John is the Deputy Director in the SEC's Office of Investor Education and Advocacy. And also with us today is Ms. Jackie Lamb. She is a personal finance writer and AFC accredited financial coach. We are bringing the fire today, y'all. So pull out your pen and your paper, get ready to take some notes because we have a great webinar planned for you today. Now, before I get too excited, I have to go over a few housekeeping items and then I need to update you on what's happening at Consumer Action. Now, this is a nine minute webinar. If you have any questions for our fabulous guest speakers, put them in the chat box. At the end of all presentations, my coworker, Nelson Santiago, is gonna facilitate a question and answer segment. This is where we get to hear from you to keep the conversation moving with your questions. This webinar is being recorded and it will live in perpetuity on our YouTube channel. You will receive a link uh, to the recording and all handouts by tomorrow afternoon, if not sooner. AFC professionals, you will receive the password to claim your 1.5 CEUs tomorrow as well. At the end of the webinar, you receive a survey. I need you to complete it as soon as possible and send it back to us. And in addition for attending today, you get a bonus. You get a certificate of completion. Now, Consumer Action is presenting this webinar with funding from the NASDAQ Foundation. So a special thanks and a shout out to the foundation for supporting consumer action, for believing in our mission and help and helping us reach so many people from across the US. Now, let me update you on what's happening at Consumer Action. For those of you who uh, are new to Consumer Action and wondering what we do, we are an educational and advocacy organization. What do we do? Through education and advocacy, we fight for strong consumer rights and policies that promote fairness fairness for all consumers, but especially our underrepresented, marginalized consumers nationwide. Now, while you're on our homepage, you see that little burgundy link in the middle? Click on that link and you will land on our COVID-19 educational project page. There you will find a ton of relevant, easy to use resources and tools uh, that, that you can use to serve uh, the, your communities. Now, let me tell you about our latest project, thanks to NASDAQ. We have created easy to read multilingual guides for consumers on investing. That's right. You can go to our website and download free guides on investing that will provide you with information on why, when, and how much to invest, the different types of investments, how to manage risks and costs, avoiding scams and if you don't read anything please read that section on scam and fraud and there's a ton of resources uh, in the guides as well and did i tell you the guides are free now since women have uh, additional challenges to overcome when planning for the future and get and to get started investing we've created a multilingual guide for women women take control of your financial future that is the title of the guide in the guide we identify some of the barriers that women face it also explains why women must invest and it offers tips and resources to help them start investing so men you're out there read it read the challenges women face 
And if your wife is not investment, take it to her and share it, share it with her. Investing is critical to uh, achieving long-term financial security and building generational wealth. But for a number of reasons, women and communities of colors, they invest at a lower rate. So our multilingual guide uh, for communities of color explain the various to barriers to investing for that community and why it's cu crucial extremely crucial for these communities to start investing now. And it also provides them with tips on how to get started investing and how to stay on track. We need to get this information in the hands of consumers as soon as possible. So when you're on our website from our homepage, you can click, you can click on select the training module under the quick menu, then select investing from the drop down menu. And voila, you can, the guides, will come up. You can print the guides, you can print copies of the guides, you can share them with your family, your friends, your church members. I've downloaded and saved and emailed uh, copies to my adult children and my high school grandkids. Why? Because it's never too early to start investing. Now, let me go over the roadmap with you quickly so you know where we're headed today. We open every training, regardless of whether it's virtual or in person with a game. And the name of the game is, how much do you know? Today, we have three true or false questions. All of the questions um, were taken from the multilingual guys I just described to you. After the game, I will introduce you to our guest speakers. The question and answer segment led by Nelson Santiago will follow. I will come back, tell you how you can donate to Consumer Action and wrap up. So this is how the game is played. There are three true or false questions. First, I would read the question and you would use the chat box to answer the question. Then I will close the poll and take a look at the results and I will tell you if the statement is true or false and why and where you can get additional uh, information. And the person with the most correct answers, drum roll please, he or she would receive bragging rights to how much do you know? So are you ready? Let's roll out that first question. This first question is about financial exposure or risk. And uh, financial exposure is the amount an investor stand to lose in an investment should the investment fail. Okay, so question one. Asset, uh, asset allocation and portfolio diversification are broadly used strategies for managing financial exposure. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Is that true or is that false? Okay, a couple more seconds. I'm closing the poll. Okay, let's close the poll and take a look at the results. Wow, 97% of you think this is a think that's a true statement, and only 3% think the statement is false. 3%, you're incorrect. That statement is true. And you will hear more about financial exposure or risk from our guest speaker, Jackie Lamb, Jackie Lamb, today. And if you want any additional information, please consult our multilingual guides on investing. You'll find a ton of information there. Let's move on to question two. You're doing great. You're doing fantastic. Let's move on to question two. Question two is about um, micro investing and the amount of money it takes to start investing. Question two. Micro investing can involve saving small spare change and investing it. Is that true or is that false? Micro investing can involve saving small spare change and investing it. Is that true or false? Okay, a couple more seconds. I'm gonna close the poll. Okay, let's close the poll and take a look at the results. Eighty-nine percent says it's a true statement. Eleven percent says it's a false statement. Actually, it is a true statement. So when someone asks you for your spare change, remember you can put your own spare change in the jar and save it and invest. The uh, there's a misconception that a large amount of money is needed to begin uh, investing, and this misconception is keeping a lot of consumers from getting started. 
there are some personal finance apps out there like Acorn and Stash that um, offer debit cards that will automatically round up your purchase and, and invest it into different ETFs. When, for an example, if um, you bought something that was $5.50 and may round it off to $5 and take that into sit and, and invest it for you. You're doing great. Let's move on to the last, the very last question. Question three is about women and money. Women and money. A true or false, a recent study found that 58% of women manage everyday expenses, but only 42% take the lead and regard take the lead regarding long-term financial planning is that true or false a recent study found that 58 percent of women manage everyday expenses but only 42 percent take the lead regarding long-term financial planning is that true or false okay let's take a poll let's take a look at the results let's close the poll take a look at the results 89 percent believe that's a free a true statement. 11% thinks it's a false statement. 11%, you are absolutely correct. That, that statement is totally, totally false. A recent study conducted by US UBS found that 85% of women manage everyday expenses, but only 23% take the lead when it comes to long-term planning. So, so even though women are proactive with their day-to-day -day household finance, they don't necessarily have the experience making long-term financial planning decision and managing an investment portfolio. You can find um, in the handouts that you receive tomorrow will be a link to that article. So you can take a look at that um, study uh, for yourself. Uh, and if you want any additional information and tips for women on investment, remember, you can download that guide on investing for women and uh, get additional information. Thank you for um, playing the game. Um, let me move on and introduce you to our first guest speaker. Our first guest speaker is John Moses. He is Deputy Director in the SEC's Office of Investor Education and Advocacy, where he works on outreach, investors outreach and education, including uh, supporting SEC's financial inclusion efforts. He uh, previously worked as a managing executive in the office of the chairman, and he began his SEC service as a deputy director in the office of minority and women inclusion. Uh, John's private sector experience include international work in real estate and hospitality industry, and he is a U.S. Navy, Navy veteran. He, John earned his undergraduate and graduate degree at Stanford University, where he earned his commission through the Navy ROTC and his MBA at Harvard Business School, and he lives in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the uh, webinar. John. And our second speaker is uh, Jackie Lamb. She is a personal finance writer, and her work has appeared in the Business Insider, Forbes, BuzzFeed, CNET, and Times Next Advisor, an AFC accredited financial coach and money healer. She is passionate about helping freelance creatives and artists design money systems on irregular incomes and help them gain greater awareness of their money narratives and overcome mental and emotional blocks. She is the two, uh, 2022 recipient of Money Management International Financial Literacy and Education and Communities Lease Award. She lives in Los Angeles where she spent her free time swimming, drumming, and daydreaming about stickers. Welcome, Jackie. Our first uh, presenter is John Moses, and I'm going to uh, turn the program over to him by giving him control. Uh, control of the mouse. John, you have control, you can take it away. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, really appreciated the, the introduction and the, the quiz. That last one especially I thought was, was interesting um, re regarding women's experience with uh, managing day-to-day -day finances versus long-term investing and uh, very happy to be with you. So I think I've got control here. Okay, great. Uh, so good morning uh, to everybody on the, the West Coast and good afternoon to the fellow East Coast attendees. Um, I'm John, I'm very happy to be here to talk about investing. 
and building wealth through savings and investing. So I was, uh, I'll, well, I give a little bit of an introduction. I will put up this disclaimer, please read it. Certainly note that we're not providing official SEC policy, legal interpretations or investment advice. So I'll leave that up um, for a moment while I mention that I think it's really helpful to think about your financial future and the financial future of your uh, community members that you serve, your, your end clients, thinking maybe about sort of two different frameworks. The first is just a three-part way to think about wealth and actions to take. So I'll start each of these off with verbs. We might think about one, pay, <laughs> pay down high interest debt, two, save, save for emergencies and opportunities. And I think the opportunities part is key, not just emergencies. And then three, invest for the long term. So we'll talk about that as we go throughout the, the conversation today about paying down high interest debt, saving for emergencies and opportunities and investing for the long term. And then maybe another uh, element that is useful is just thinking about starting small. So that's why I love Linda's uh, discussion of, of micro investing and just getting started with whatever you have. And I think that second part I want us to think about as we, we talk today, and that is understanding some of the concepts and building some of the infrastructure to save and invest, right? Do you have the accounts? Do you know your passwords? Do you have a plan? And then also having a habit, right? So even if you don't have a lot of money to start, you can have a habit and a, a, a framework and that infrastructure. So maybe it's just, uh, you know, $5, $10, maybe it's $1 um, to get started. But over time, if you have opportunities through a promotion, a new job or a one-off gain, like a, a tax refund or some other kind of one-off gain, then you have the infrastructure and the habit to, uh, to, to leverage that opportunity. So the other thing that I want to mention is that I'll think about this as sort of a train the trainer. I think everybody here supports community members as end clients. And so I'll talk a bit about the SEC and that way you can learn about our resources and our uh, sort of perspective and you can leverage that in a way that makes the most sense for you and your clients going forward. Um, let me just check in, Linda, you can uh, you can hear me okay? I think we're good. Let, let me know if, every, if we have any audio issues. So- Are you um, great? Fantastic. So I'll start. Um, and, and then I think that uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the, the conversation with Jackie, who's going to go into, I think, a deeper dive on that last part, investing for the long term. Um, but, but we'll cover a few things. So first, the SEC. Um, so very briefly, our mission is three parts to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly and efficient markets and facilitate capital formation. So that's the SEC. But I think we can maybe dive into that a little bit and think about some of our responsibilities. So one of the things we do is review disclosures of, of public companies. We examine broker dealers and investment advisors and other market participants, and we enforce securities laws. So for example, in fiscal year 2022, we collected $6.4 billion from over 700 enforcement actions, and that, that money goes back to the, to the treasury. So um when uh our, our chairman says that we're the the cop on the beat in this space that's some of what he's referring to let's talk a little bit about these markets right so this is a vast and complex series of markets really is with over 15,000 investment advisors many hundreds of investment companies thousands of reporting companies and thousands of broker dealers um we also oversee self-regulatory organizations some of which you all might be familiar with uh like finra for example so this is a very large market and uh, a baby, a high level view of that is the size of it. So this is over a hundred trillion in, in equity markets, over 200 trillion in fixed income markets trading in a year. And it impacts day-to-day -day Americans, but maybe uh, very much to Linda's point, not enough of our underserved communities, uh, but about 67 million families in America are direct or indirect holders of stock. So I work in our investor uh, Office of Investor Education and Advocacy. So we process about 30,000 complaints and questions and other contacts from investors. Um, we also do events like this, uh, both from our headquarters office and, and offices around the country, including out there in LA, uh, but we're in Miami, we're in Fort Worth, we're in Denver and New York and Chicago and a few others as well. Um, so you can connect with us at outreach at sec.gov. 
if uh, you would like a presentation for your community focused organization, or if you have a, a complaint or a problem or a question, um, you can connect with us at help at sec.gov. And I'll go over these at, again at the end, help at sec.gov. So, um, and this is probably familiar to a lot of you that are community focused. You know, we provide um, education, not advice. So we want to teach people, um, you know, the basics of saving the investor education, but not exactly what to save or uh, what to invest in, certainly. So we give an introduction to products, to risks, to fees and strategies like diversification that, that Linda mentioned earlier, uh, but we don't recommend specific assets, funds, companies, or investment professionals. Um, but we do think that informed investors are more likely to succeed and meet their goals and much less likely to be scammed. There is, as Linda said, a lot of fraud out there, which we'll touch on a little bit more. Um, we run investor.gov, which is, you know, focuses on individual investors like you and me. So investor.gov uh, is, we, you can of course reach us at sec.gov, but investor.gov is where we have a lot of resources focused on an individual investors. And you can see items like our tools and calculators, our alerts and bulletins, um, lots of other information that, that you will find useful. It's also available, as you see here, some of the content in Spanish, which we're working on, on building out. Okay. So let's dive into saving and investing. So first of all, I think we want to think about how do we get some assets? We need some assets. As Linda said, maybe it's just, you know, a spare change literally, uh, or, or maybe it's something more. But at some point, we need to separate our income from our expenses. And we might do that by thinking about what our needs and wants are. And so we have this, we have basic needs like, you know, water, food, shelter. How can we separate out those uh, expenses so that we have extra money that we can then uh, save and invest? At the baseline, we need to do some of these, make some of these decisions. Some of them are tougher, right? So today we might think of smartphones uh, as, as a requirement, and then we might think about how we can reduce our expenses and increase our capacity to save and invest. Similarly, we might need a car uh, if, uh, if we need that for transit to work. Internet service can be crucial. Uh, if we don't have access to it through another way. So some of these can be very tough calls, certainly want to recognize that, but at some point we need to uh, create some space to save and invest. Even before we save and invest though, we might at least want to understand what our debt situation is. Often the highest uh, sort of best return that we can get if we are in the um, unfortunate but, but all too common situation where we have a high interest debt, that can be our best first move to pay down that high interest debt. Maybe as a first question, uh, go ahead and put in the chat, what interest rate do you estimate your community members, the clients you support pay on credit cards and personal loans? Just throw in the chat if you can, what interest rate do they pay? And maybe uh, if I'm not seeing them, Nelson, everybody else will, or, or you can share a couple. So important to think in mind, what, what interest rate are they paying on credit cards or personal loans? Okay, so step one, as I mentioned, pay down that high interest debt. Step two, we wanna save for emergencies, right? So we need to have a buffer to deal with the volatility and in income. And again, I love the perspective that Jackie's gonna bring dealing with uh, supporting freelancers and other creatives that might have particularly volatile or lumpy income. Uh, but really all of us need this, right? Because we never know when we might have an emergency, whether that's a, you know, a, a medical emergency, another family emergency, a broken car, maybe even a broken phone can be an emergency. Um, and we need to also have resources to take advantage of one uh, one time opportunities, right? So maybe we have that infrastructure if we have a tax refund or uh, a gift, uh, but we might also want to build that up to take advantage of opportunities like a new a new job that necess necessitates a move, for example. Importantly, it can be really useful to automate this, right? So if you can set up, again, thinking about that infrastructure I spoke about at the beginning, if you can automate some of this, then you don't have to make so many decisions, right? These decisions can be burdensome and taxing sort of in terms of time, but also mentally and emotionally. So if you can come up with a plan and automate it, that can be extremely powerful. And we think about that for savings and investing. So. The second thing, again, we want to think about after paying down high interest debt or maybe in coordination with it is saving for emergencies or opportunities. But saving is not investing. So saving is money that we place 
in a low risk, usually federally insured accounts to be there, right? So we're assigning this money a job. We are assigning this money a job of being there for short-term goals um, or as an emergency fund, right? So maybe we're saving up, for example, for a new phone, for a car, um, maybe for something like uh, you know a family trip that we're going to take next summer. Um, that is money that we assign for our savings. Money that we assign to invest is money that we are putting at risk, importantly, for the possibility of greater returns over time and is generally used for longer term goals, maybe not a year or two or three, but five or 10 or even decades in the future, like uh, retirement. So uh, as we go forward here, Nelson, I don't know if we got an answer on uh, the uh, interest rate that people are, uh, are estimating that their clients pay on credit cards or, or personal loans. But a next question to consider is how would you explain in just a couple of words compound growth to a client new to investing concepts so you have someone coming in they want to invest they want to understand why that might be important certainly compound growth is a key part of that understanding so put in the chat or just think about how would you explain that to a client we like to use an example uh, and i'll go through this really quickly this should be familiar to most of the folks here of putting money away and saving it, and we'll uh, assume no growth here on the lower line, right? So we'll assume we'll put that into an account with essentially zero interest, right? A savings account with gen essentially zero interest, say like a checking account that doesn't uh, charge any fees, but does not pay any interest. And we'll compare, that's the bottom line. So this is $100 a month, so $1,200 a year over a 40 year working career. If we save that $100 a month, $1,200 a year, we will have accumulated $48,000, which is nice, right? We've grown it over time. That's that straight line at the bottom. We like to tell people that if you invest, you can grow your money faster than a straight line, right? So that's why over that same 40 years with that same amount of money, $100 a month, if we were to earn a 7% average annual return, our money can grow faster because the growth is the money uh, is earning money, right? And so it is growing like a, a snowball. Probably you will talk to your clients about debt snowballs where it's negative, right? It's a problem, uh, a vicious cycle. In this example, we can get into a virtuous cycle where growth grows on growth, right? And so we have a massive difference of about 240 grand through investing, earning in this example, a 7% annual return. Uh, and so 240 grand in that example and only 48 grand, which did sound, <laughs> sound impressive at the start until we realized what we could do if we were able to invest it. Again, we probably wanna do a combination of both of these. Another way to think about this is the power of compounding and starting early, right? So we tell people that young people, one of their superpowers is time, right? And if you don't have a lot of money, it really helps to have a lot of time. So in this example, in the left column, we see that if you're 25 years old and you want $250,000 by age 65, right, we could save that same about, it should make sense based on the previous slide, about $100, $104 a month, earning that same 7% annual return. But if we were to wait until 45, we would need $500 a month, or we waited until 55, we'd need $1,500 a month. And you can see similar examples, just roughly doubled for uh, if you were looking to have a $500,000 portfolio on the right. Again, this assumes a 7% annual uh, return. And all of these can be uh, generated by using the calculator on investor.gov. If you want to look at your own situation, look at different current amounts of assets, different amounts, different returns, and different amounts of investing uh, that you add, different amounts uh, that you add to your investment portfolio over time, all that's on the calculators section of investor.gov. So Linda talked about uh, retirement investing. So again, thinking about, and I'm, and I'm seeing uh, some, some uh, results from the interest rates, right? So five to 30, mostly mid to high 20s, right? So, and some examples from uh, the, oh, great, thank you. So some examples also from uh, the chat. Thanks for, for plugging those in. And, and again, thinking about what kind of, return you get on paying down and hopefully avoiding building back up high interest debt 
as you consider that as part of your financial approach. So next question is, what are the advantages of making your employer's 401k a starting point for building wealth? So how would you explain that to your community members, your clients? So here's some basic things to keep in mind. First of all, there can be tax advantages. I think folks here are familiar with, with the basic tax advantages uh, in terms of 401ks. You also importantly might get a match, right? And that is free money essentially. And if you're matching every dollar that you put in up to a certain amount, you might think about that as a hundred percent return on that money. So very, very powerful wealth accumulating um, aspect to 401ks. Uh, importantly, you can keep these 401ks even if you change jobs. You can roll them over or convert them to an IRA, which as we note at the bottom is another tax advantaged way to save for retirement, save and invest for retirement. Importantly, you can open one regardless of whether your employer offers a 401k and they still have these tax advantages. So very important places to begin. And again, going back to that automated element, we think that these are great places to think about putting your wealth building on autopilot, right? So you can access this compounding um, benefit and you also can dollar cost average, right? So when markets are up, you might buy fewer shares. Uh, and when markets are down, you would buy uh, more when assets are on sale, so to speak. But over decades, we would hope to see some positive returns. So think about in conjunction with your clients, whether their employer offers a automatic payroll direct deposit to their 401k and what percentage of their income they can allocate to that. And importantly, if they get a raise or a promotion, if they can increase or are able to find savings elsewhere, if they can increase that over time. Also, a lot of smaller, or excuse me, a lot of employers, large employers, uh, offer 401ks even to entry level workers. So, whether this is in food service or transportation or retail, a lot of large employers now do offer 401ks to a wide swath of their in, uh, employees. So, let's talk about protecting ourselves a bit. So, there is a lot of information about investing. Um, I am, again, looking forward to, to some of the, the, the baseline information that Jackie's gonna to provide to us as well. Uh, we want you to have resources like investor.gov to go to uh, for you, for your clients, when they're seeing things like celebrity endorsements. Remember, the celebrities will get paid whether or not you make money. Social media, right, there can be a lot of bad or questionable investing advice. Friends and family, right? Your cousin may make a lot of money, but is their risk uh, approach and asset allocation, which I think Jackie's gonna go over, is that appropriate for you? Maybe not. So make sure you are playing the long game and doing your own research. Uh, Linda asked that we touch on, on crypto assets, which of course uh, are, are have been variously in the news. Uh, remember that the, the track record is what it is compared to other resource, other assets. It's relative, it's shorter uh, compared to some other assets. Also, there might be a mismatch between the laws and, and compliance, and these are highly speculative assets. With all speculative or highly risky assets, you should only consider investing what you can afford to lose. Um, we go over this in much more detail in a uh, an investor alert, which uh, is from March. You can see that on investor.gov. Uh, it's called Exercise Caution with Crypto Asset Security. So please check out that alert. It'll go over topics like whether or not a given asset is complying with applicable law, including securities laws. Uh, stepping back a little bit from, from that topic, Think about apps and ease. So this is incredibly powerful. It's uh, very beneficial in a lot of ways to be able to access the markets uh, through your phone, through apps. Couple of things to keep in mind. While this can lower uh, transaction fees and, and pr improve access, which, which can again be beneficial, think about whether apps or online platforms are giving you access to complex or high risk products and make sure that you understand those products. So things like buying on margin, um, using using leverage that you may or may not understand and may or may not be appropriate, especially for people beginning their investing journey. 
Similarly, be careful that you are not encouraged to over trade if there's gamification or prompts, right? Uh, that tell you about stock moves or give you, uh, you know, rewards or other types of nudges that may or may not comport with your or your client's needs. So once we have paid down our, our high interest debt, we're saving for uh, emergencies and opportunities, we're investing for the long term, certainly we wanna make sure uh, as we, again, build that infrastructure and those habits that we are avoiding fraud. So there's a lot of fraud, as Linda said, many billions of dollars of fraud. Uh, a lot of it is keyed towards investment scams. And so there's a few things to keep in mind and a resource I wanna uh, make sure to point out for, for you and your, um, your, your community members. So uh, first, remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. <laughs> be careful if you're asked to pay for any investment with cryptocurrency, with gift cards or wires overseas. Again, once you have paid or delivered the, uh, the, the money to this investment or purported investment, it is very difficult to get it back. So make sure you um, think very carefully before uh, you invest, that you understand who you're dealing with and what they are selling before you invest. Um, and certainly don't be pressured to buy quickly before you've done your research. So we have a program called How We Trade. I want you to all, uh, at, after our event today, go on to investor.gov, or you can look on YouTube for How We Trade. This is a mock promotion where we have uh, a, a video where uh, someone is trying to sell a invest, an investment program and it is a scam. It is a, a little bit tongue in cheek, a little bit funny, uh, but it, hopefully it will help you and your clients think through the elements of fraud. We have a companion video that goes through this. We find it's useful with all types of audiences, but especially younger ones uh, who can talk through the elements of the scam where he offers guaranteed returns, where he suggests that it's a time-limited opportunity only open to a few folks who invest quickly. So check that out. It's also avail available on investor.gov. Be aware of some of the persuasion tactics of fraudsters. They might promise phantom riches. They might suggest that other savvy investors have already invested, something you'll see in the Howey Trade program. They'll suggest they might do you a small favor they might suggest that this is, again, as in how we trade, uh, very uh, urgent because there's a limited supply. And they might suggest that they have a source of credibility, right, through credentials or some kind of affinity with you, whether that's a religious affinity. Um, we see a lot of scams focused on military or veterans, uh, ethnic communities, religious communities, as I said. So uh, a lot more on investor.gov for that. You can also check out any investment professional on investor.gov. So you can see if they have uh, a license or registration, you can see their employment history and any disclosures. So it is not 100% of providers need to be registered, but a large portion of investment scams are um, perpetrated by people who are not registered. So it's a great place to start and understand uh, what and who you're dealing with. There's also re other resources that we can provide to those of you who are running community organizations. So if you connect with us at outreach at sec.gov, we can send you um, these materials that are available here. Lots of different guides for seniors, for students, uh, for military and veterans, uh, and how to stop fraud, all kinds of guides. We also have some of them in Spanish. We have a Twitter account, uh, sec underscore investor underscore ed. Uh, so you can uh, follow us on um, on Twitter. We have a YouTube channel with some videos from uh, different parts of the SEC, including our chair. And you can also see on investor.gov those bulletins, not just the, the crypto ones, but lots of others that might be relevant for you or your uh, community members. We have other uh, sort of directed uh, a, a, materials like this one for returning citizens, people returning back into the community after incarceration. Again, you can reach out to us at outreach at sec.gov for any of those. Or if you have a client with a particular problem related to investing, they have a question, a concern, they can contact us on this number or email help at sec.gov. So these are free resources 
for uh, you and for your community members. So with that, um, thanks so much for participating. Thanks for the, the notes about um, matching and uh, why retirement accounts can be really powerful. And I think we're going to dive in now with Jackie to talk uh, a bit more about investing strategies and products. Thanks so much again, reach out to us if we can be of service to your um, organization, if it's community focused, we are at outreach at sec.gov. Thanks so much, Linda. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Thank you for the great information and the resources for our audience. Now, let me turn it over to uh, Jackie Lamb so we can hear uh, more about our presentation. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, you have control. Well, thank you, Linda, and thank you, John, for such a great presentation. So uh, as John started with the importance of saving and investing, uh, I will delve into more of the nitty gritty on investment, so investment risks, and the importance of just diversification, particularly for women and communities of color. Because as Linda mentioned earlier, uh, women and communities of color have some particular challenges and hurdles and considerations to um, factor in when they're starting out with investing. And uh, okay, so first of all, just a quick introduction. As Linda mentioned, I'm a personal finance writer, a financial coach and educator, and I specialize particularly in holistic money management for artists and creative freelancers. So what that means is not just looking at the uh, basics and also some practical advice, but more on how to improve uh, one's relationship with money. Because as we know, a lot of times we make decisions about money that are not necessarily rational because money is rooted in emotions. And so when you can combine the practical knowledge and information and advice that's out there and align it with our own relationship to money, we can make more empowered and authentic decisions. Okay, so, so to start, why is it important for women and uh, people of color, POC folks, to invest? Well, first of all, women live longer and they also make less. And as we all know, investing is one of the main pillars to build wealth to ensure financial security in later years. And as John mentioned, in order to do that, we have to start by freeing up some space, creating space by saving. Investing also builds generational wealth. So it uh, builds wealth to pass on to your children, grandchildren, any heirs, uh, you may want to pass on wealth. And without investing, it's gonna be that much more challenging to grow your money for that money to compound uh, if you're just keeping into a savings account. And also investing is important because it increases education and knowledge, which can be shared with loved ones, friends, children and community. And that is important because I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up in a family that really uh, knew a lot about investing. I grew up in a household where it was a lot about saving. Uh, growing up Asian American, you save, 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 which is obviously very important. As John mentioned, it's important to have emergency savings. It's important to have money for a short-term a goal, a big ticket item, but without you know, understanding how investing works and why it's important, we can increase that education and knowledge to those around us, which can help them in be inspired to also invest and grow their wealth um, for their financial future. So next we're gonna go over some stumbling blocks women and communities of color have when it comes to investing. So first of all, uh, tend to be behind with investing in the stock market. Uh, there's a couple of uh, quick facts. 57% of women don't have stocks or stock market investments compared to 43% of men. 60% of black US adults and 63% of Hispanics don't have stocks compared to about half of white Americans, and 62% of working women are behind on retirement compared to 48% of working men. And last, about a quarter of black workers and a third of Hispanic workers weren't contributing between September 2021 to 2022, compared to about one fifth of white workers. So you're looking at these numbers going, hey, what's going on? You know, why aren't women and POC investing? What are the, the stumbling blocks? And also, oh, more likely to pull out the stock market during volatility. 
So 20% of Black American investors and 22% of Hispanic investors moved money out of stock-related investments compared to 13% of white counterparts during market volatility. And uh, might be scared to invest. 19% uh, of women don't think the stock market is the best way to invest in long term. And this may be for a number of reasons. There might be the prevailing myth that investing is like gambling. Um, and there's also the, you know, the idea that some people may just not be comfortable or educated enough to start investing. Or they might not feel like they have enough money to invest. Okay, so some of the different challenges. The wealth gap persists. Uh, there's less money to invest with. So if there's less money to invest with, then you know you, you don't feel like you can be at a place to start investing in. And so also, if you don't have as much making enough money, as much money as uh, your white counterparts, uh, you won't have as much in savings either, right? Um, POC aren't as likely to get an inheritance as white counterparts. When they do, it's usually less. So, you know, when you have a little bit of windfall of cash, it makes that, that much easier to get started. And then balancing financial needs of family versus themselves. And something that isn't really talked about as much uh, that should be talked about is that a lot of women and at POC come from cultural backgrounds and expectations and pressures that they not only need to be balancing their own financial needs and financial future, but also that of, you know, their grandparents, their mom and dad, maybe their siblings or cousins who are, aren't doing well and are calling them up for loans. So um, because of that, you know, because there's not enough money to begin with because the wealth gap persists. And then John mentioned um, paying high interest debt, which is also something that um, women in POC tend to have more debt for different reasons. Um, uh, women actually tend to get more higher education and degrees. So with that comes student debt. Um, because of that, it, you can see how the, the tail, the, the scales are tipped, uh, you know, because of all these factors and also discrimination, right? When you have bias and lack of opportunity and access to resources uh, to have money to invest, it's going to be that much harder. And last, I, I touched about, upon this a little bit, but the fear of the stock market. You know, if the stock market is run by by folks and investment gurus that they don't identify with, uh, that you know may not look like them, may not act like them, and may not uh, talk about situations and circumstances that relate to them, it might be create some kind of dissonance or distance from investing, um, where you know investing is for other people who look more like these people who are telling you what to do versus people who I can relate to, and a family doesn't invest. Uh, if you come from a family that doesn't invest in the stock market or retirement accounts, then you may not understand to do that and you may not think to do that. And, and as I mentioned, myth, myth and misconceptions about the stock market. So AKA it's like gambling. I don't know if you've had friends or your clients or communities that you work with say, you know, oh, the stock market went down and uh, I took it out. I don't want to gamble my money or they thought they lost the money, right? Versus uh, losing the value of the stocks, which is another misconception people have, is that when you know the, the stock market is down, they thought they lost the money versus the value of the actual stocks are uh, have lost value. Okay. So next piece is getting into investing mindset, and I thought this would be interest uh, important to include because without the investing mindset, it might be hard to get motivated or to start with investing. Okay, so first of all, uh, know your why. Without the personal why of investing, the technical know-how and advice is less likely to stick. So I don't know about you, but I, I really come across a lot of advice, advice about how to invest, what to do. And it makes sense, right? It makes sense on paper. It makes sense logically, but then if you don't know your why of investing, it may not have reason to actually get started. So your why could be different. Uh, based on your your goals. So why are you investing? What are your financial goals, both short term and long term? And how can investing help you achieve these goals? So it could be anything from retirement, right? Uh, if you're retiring or not for 30 years, uh, what kind of lifestyle do you want? You know, what kind of comforts do you want? What kind of income would you like to have ideally when you retire? If you have children and you want to invest maybe because they're going to be going to college and 15 years, 20 years, 
that's another goal, right? And uh, or you might just want to invest for saving for a down payment on a house. Okay, so understand time investment horizons. So time horizon investment horizon is basically another way of saying how long you have to save for a goal. And how long you have to save for a goal, it determines the level of risk you take. So as it goes, if you have less time to save for a goal, you uh, can't really withstand the ups and downs of the stock market. So you, it tends to be more conservative in the types of accounts and your investing approach or types of investments. And if you have more time to save for a goal, saying you know you don't need to retire in 30 years, uh, you have a, a probably a higher level of risk you can take because you can withstand the ups and downs of uh, market volati volatility, and then in the long run you will grow your money. So here's some examples. The three main time horizons, the three buckets are the first is short term, so up to three years typically. So these goals might include saving for a big ticket item, emergency savings, paying off debt. And as John mentioned in his presentation, emergency savings, you know, tend to try to have three to six months. And investment vehicles uh, that are common for short term um, goals are, you know, high yield savings accounts, because right now there's a lot of savings accounts that are giving uh, a higher percentage, like I've seen some 5% higher uh, CDs, certificates of deposits. The next one is medium term. So this is kind of three to 10 years, right? So goals might include buying a house, a car, sending kids off to college, and investment vehicles. This is a very broad generalization, but a mix of high risk and lower risk uh, investments like stocks, like a mix of stocks and bonds. And you, you want to talk to your communities and clients want to talk to like investing professional exactly how that would look, right? So long term, is typically more than 10 years. So goals might include saving for retirement, aging in place, and investment vehicles or retirements like IRAs, IRAs, and 401ks. And as John mentioned, um, starting with your employer and taking advantage of employer-sponsored uh, retirement accounts is a great way to start for your clients and your communities. Okay, so just gut check, meaning you understand your story around investing. And this could be anything, right? We all have our own money story. And a money story is just your narrative, your beliefs, your perceptions, your observations and experiences around money, particularly about investing. And this can run the gamut from, you know, I had an uncle who did amazing with this one stock. You know, he put all of his money in this one stock and then he made tons of money and then he, you know some some story like that or it could be i'm really scared of investing because i don't know how to do it i don't know how to start nobody in my family does it my friends have who do it like they've they've lost so there might be some fear right so of, of the emotions you have around investing and common emotions you have as uh, are you know fear because you just don't know uh and investing is very different than than saving and you know, John mentioned it's it's the the more of a habit and a framework and infrastructure, right? And same with investing. You know, you're creating these these homes because, or like um, I have a metaphor that we can get into, but just being aware of your emotions is very very important as well. And then knowing what style of investor you are, are you more cautious or comfortable taking risks? Because that will influence your approach, and not not only the time. Um, frame, but also your style investing. Do you want to be more hands off or more hands on? And that will impact the, where you start. Now, if you want to go with a robo advisor or you want to work with a professional uh, investment professional, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Okay. So just a quote, the more you know about you, the better choices about investing you can make. So as I mentioned, a holistic approach, uh, connecting you, your goals, your style, your um, your emotions with the practical knowledge. Okay, so we're gonna go over investment risks next. So th there are main risks that come with investing and, and uh, as you know, all investments have some level of risk. Otherwise, you know, it'd be a lot simpler, right? Let's like take a look at the most common ones. So the first one is inflation risks. So this is just saying invest in conservative investments such as high yield savings accounts, 
and CDs are prone to inflation risks. So this is when the interest rate doesn't keep up with the rate in inflation. So if you're parking your money into a savings account um, that has a certain you know, interest rate and it's not keeping up with the where inflation is with that rate, uh, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on potential growth because you're actually losing money, right, in a way, because inflation is going to eat up into anything you earn on that interest. The next common uh, risk that comes with investing is market li liquidity risk. So in other words, how difficult is it to buy and sell and cash out of investment? How difficult and how long will it take to convert your investment to, uh, to cash? And if you don't uh, quote unquote exit quick, quickly enough, the investment could lose value. So that's what market liquidity risk means. And last is, this is the one we're going to delve into next in greater detail is having all your eggs in one basket. It's like putting it all in one stock, like I mentioned your uncle, uh, putting it all in one stock and it poses a greater risk, right? Because sure that stock may have some moments when it's doing really well and outperforming, um, but then uh, there could be moments when it's not doing well. And then in that case, you are you lose out more, you, you have a greater loss because you're just putting all your eggs in one basket. And then the risk of not investing, um, and women of, and communities of color might have been taught to save, save and save, and this is my case as well. You know, you have that finger wagging person in your life saying, just save your money, don't spend it, which, you know, to an extent is true. You know, it's obviously very important to have emergency savings having some money in parked in a savings account so you can have easy access to it in case of an emergency but however on the flip side it results in something called cash drag and cash drag simply means it's the opportunity to grow your money and uh, build wealth with other strategies uh, namely investing and it's not timing of the market it's time in the market and i just wanted to uh, comment on john mentioning those uh tools and calculators on investor.gov uh, a great motivator and it's something i love doing because i'm a money nerd is going to investor.gov and using the savings goals calculator tool and the this is my particular favorite is the compound interest tool so you can see as he showed in that great chart if you save a hundred dollars from when you're 25 and you go up to 65 you know how much you'll earn on that 40,000 versus you just not um, starting early and if you haven't started early if your clients or communities haven't started early it's okay you know it's it's just consistently saving and investing over time that makes a difference there's also a great um, example that I've heard time and time again is if somebody with compound interest if they started at 25 they put in a hundred bucks a month until they're 35 and they stop right versus the other person who doesn't start till 35 and they end at 65 and they put the same amount, the person who started at 25 uh, and ends at 35 actually because of compound interest will earn more. Well, the money will grow more. So I thought that was always interesting. Just piggybacking on what, what John had uh, examples earlier. Okay, so we're gonna talk about managing risks. So, you know, two strategies, asset allocation and diversification. So managing risk asset allocation. Basically, how many eggs you're going to be put, you're going to put in each basket. And a basket represents an asset class, which is like stocks, bonds, cash or cash equivalents, and money market accounts are our main asset classes. And then diversification is spreading your investments both among and within different asset classes. So basically putting your investments in different baskets, right? So we have a little photo image here of the basket, but then within the basket, there's different, there's diversification. So there might be different size eggs, different color eggs, you know, chicken eggs, <laughs> turkey eggs, quail eggs, whatever. So for example, within stocks, you can invest in different sized companies, different sectors, and different locations. So different size could be small, mid, large cap companies, sectors could be anything, right? Uh, solar energy, retail, health, and then locations is domestic versus international. And within bonds, you can have different bond issuers, like there's 
government and corporations. And I think a lot of people may not know there's corporate bonds as well as government like municipal bonds and different credit ratings. And the exact allocation depends, uh, as we talked about, your comfort level with risks, your time frame for your goals and your life changes. You know, there might be some life changing situation that's like, hold on, I was doing this investment strategy and I need to like kind of switch gears and do something different so that I can be aligned with my goals and my um, preferences. And usually the closer you are to the target date, the more conservative the spread. So strategies for diversification. So, so here are some common ones and you probably, your clients and communities have probably heard these tossed around, but what exactly do each mean? So mutual funds, it's a type of investment that is a pooled collection of stocks, bonds, money market instruments, and other investment securities. So you can think of it as a pooled collection of a bunch of different assets. And it, this is, these are managed by professional money managers and um, portfolio managers. So typically they have higher fees than passively managed investments, such as index funds or ETFs. So which we'll get into next. Well, ETFs, these are baskets of bonds or stocks that are pretty similar to mutual funds, but unlike mutual funds, they can be sold and bought and sold like regular stocks. So mutual funds, they're just kind of built a different way, so you cannot tr trade them like regular stocks. And while ETFs can be actively managed, most are passively managed and track the performance of an index like you know, the NASDAQ, um, S&P 500. And because they are, are usually not actively managed, you can think of there's no, like, no driver in the seat, right? Uh, ten they tend to be lower cost, lower fees than mutual funds. Okay, so index funds. Index funds are a type of ETF or mutual fund that is designed to mirror a major single market index in both their makeup or composition and their performance. So the index funds match or track the S&P 500 and NASDAQ uh, uh, 100. These are just some indexes. Index funds are low cost, easy way to invest. They're lower cost and like an ETF, there's no portfolio manager tracking them. And last, uh, target date funds. These are also known as life cycle funds, and these contain a mix of bonds, stocks, and cash, and many companies have them. Um, for example, if you want to retire in 20 years, 2040 or 2050, let's say, um, they're going to uh, design the, the allocation so that, that they, you'll be on track and, and grow your money accordingly. So the percentage of each if each meeting stocks, bonds, and cash will change over time and is typically more conservative the closer you are to the target date. Okay, so just we uh, want to talk about rebalancing. And this is when you tweak your portfolio to match the original asset allocation and risk tolerance. So for instance, uh, let's say your portfolio mix is 70% stocks, 20% bonds, and 10% cash. Over time, the mix will, will shift because of different returns. So, you know, let's say your stocks are doing really well. And so because of the returns, you're going to have more stocks than bonds or cash. So maybe it'll go to like, uh, let's say, you know, 80% stocks, let's just say 10% bonds and 10% cash. Well, that doesn't sound bad, right? It's like, well, why wouldn't you want to keep, keep it that way? Well, stocks are doing well. Like, why won't I just keep you know, investing in stocks because it's it's giving it's growing my money. Well, well, it's important because um, you want it to stay in line with your comfort level of risk and also stick with your investment plan because if it gets out of off kilter, then um, it won't align with what you actually want to do long term. And then rule of thumb is to rebalance every quarter at least uh, once a year. Okay, so quickly, just a couple of resources. So Better Investing, this is a nonprofit investing club by the NAIC, and I've heard lots of great things for people who want information about investing and how to get started and to meet fellow uh, people who are new to investing. So for your clients or communities, this might be a good place to start. And then, uh, you know, some CPAs, investing professionals, financial coaches who cater toward women in POC. So as mentioned, sometimes it may feel a little uh, intimidating or maybe even alienating when you're not working with someone, your clients aren't working with people who they can relate to. And there are people who represent, who come from um, a different cloth, cut from different cloth and can relate maybe to your clients better. Possibly, you know, so Marie Thomason, uh, she's a CFP and founder of Modern Assets. There's 
Girls on the Money, Delani Barros, who's the money coach, Pamela Capilad of uh, French and Budgets, Jacint Omala, Anna Jaconte, Amanda Holden. So, you know, Rita Soledad, Fernandez Paulino of Wealth Bar Dodos, all um, great places to start. Um, some books, you know, Finance for the People by Paco de Leon, uh, really touches upon some systemic issues and inequalities, which is interesting. Uh, Get Good with Money by Tiffany Aliche, or The Budgetista, and Got Girls at Invest by Samran Kuar. And then, of course, government agency nonprofits and agencies like um, Investor.gov, but that's part of the SEC. Uh, FINRA, SEC, and Consumer Action, of course. Okay. Um, and then, where to find me? So, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, um, some stuff on my website, and you can reach me by email. And a disclaimer as well, uh, I'm not an investing professional or, or financial advisor, and it's not uh, investing advice. Okay, that's it. Oh, final thoughts. Um, start small and start simple. And uh, John touched upon this, of course, it's it's just, and Linda as well, with, with starting small, you know, you don't need a million dollars to start investing. You don't need to know everything you need about the, the stock market investing to get started. So consider robo-advisor platforms, <laughs> micro-investing platforms, like uh, there's so many robo-advisor platforms, but micro-investing platforms like Acorn, Stash, and discount brokerages. There are investing platforms created for women like Elvest. And as John mentioned, to um, be careful of the risks. You know, there's a lot of good that comes from these platforms that give people easy, uh, low threshold, an easy way to invest, but the, the danger is uh, one, uh, invest, uh, trading too much, investing too much, which results in fees. And also, um, you know, if you have kind of too many controls, it could create problems if you, you don't know some something, you know, and then it can create a problem later where you made a mistake because you just didn't know, but this platform gave you the, the agency to do it. So it's something to be mindful of with these um, <clears throat> platforms. And educate yourself, right? Take your advice from friends and family with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, we're human. We we like to listen to things our friends and family have done that have worked for them. But you got to know what you got to know you. You got to do you. You got to educate yourself on what what's out there, what works best for you, and your personal situation, and what you're comfortable with. And so, you know, looking at some of these uh, financial professionals, uh, these great. Um, agencies and uh, nonprofits. Reading books is, is a way to broaden and to really have like a more holistic approach. And then um, being cautious, be cautious about following tips from Money Talk, IG influencers, you know, just because someone on social media is telling you something doesn't necessarily mean it's good advice. And John mentioned that social media is riddled with lots of bad advice. So um, if, you know, research credentials, uh, John mentioned there's investor.gov. You can research if they're an investment, registered investment professional, you know, see what their credentials are, do your own homework. So particularly with there's someone out there, I see this a lot on, on Money Talk, is they want you to invest in this particular stock, you know, or, or something like that. And this is your money, obviously protect it. That's well, it. thank you, Jackie. Uh, thank you, John, for a great presentation. And thank you, um, Jackie and Jackie, thank you for um, mentioning that balancing um, financial needs of your family as a barrier, because I think that's what um, I didn't start investing until after my kids were out of college because I was trying to balance that need. Nelson, do we have a ton of questions for our guest speakers? Hey, yes, we have lots of questions, Linda, and we can jump right into them. Uh, let's see. Um, why don't we start with a few, uh, some of the basics before we get into investing. Uh, we have a question, uh, we talked about savings at the beginning. Are there any higher interest rate savings accounts out there that can be recommended or where to, where to look, where to find them? Oh, um, I guess yeah, I can uh, start. Oh, go ahead, John. Jackie, maybe we'll, we'll mention a, a few as well, but this is, um, there, there is a lot of variability in the rates, right? So a, a lot of, if you're thinking about uh, funds that you want to you know, save for months or years, as opposed to your sort of day-to-day -day checking account, um, 
there's a lot of high yield checking, uh, excuse me, high yield savings accounts um, that that right now, as of today, you know, yield uh, over four, even close to five percent. So there's, uh, we we can't recommend any any particular institution, but um, you know, you want to make sure that if it's a credit union, that it's insured by uh, NCUA. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a, a bank would need to, you want to make sure that you're dealing with an institution where the funds are FDIC insured. Um, and this is, you know, something you can, can find online or, or through a reputable, um, you know, uh, site or, or news source. Maybe I'll, I'll see if Jackie has a, a, another way to frame that. But there's definitely a big gap between what the average person is getting and what is currently available. Uh, yeah, absolutely. With what John mentioned, with there's a, a large gap with <laughs> what's out there and um, i think there are definitely uh saving rates uh comparison sites out there uh and to make sure if you're going to put your money into like a high yield savings or a cd to to look at and make sure it's in th the account is insured but also to just look at the strategies i know with like cds there's different strategies that people employ right like the latter strategy um so just not just looking at rates but also like like the trade-off right with the cd you have to lock your money in for a certain amount and typically the longer the um the term the the higher the rate but and so just to look at those things too and to look at like what the trade-off is for putting into like a high interest account great thank you and then you know somebody did mention again still in the with the basics here uh, in, in some cases, many of the clients that uh, people are serving don't even have credit cards yet. So, for example, the question about what interest rates are you paying on credit cards? Some folks don't even have those right now. Is that a barrier to getting toward investing? Um, uh, I don't think uh, not having credit card is a barrier necessarily to investing, but I would want to ask more of uh, the reasons why they don't have a credit card. If they're uh, kind of been burned by, the, you know, some way financially, like maybe they had a bad run with their credit card or they are in, you know, in a place where they can get a credit card. I think that might be a barrier in the sense that they might be scared to invest. You know, if they're not, if they're um, cautious about the credit card industry, they might be cautious about investing in the stock market. But in terms of, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, John, the basics on like, you don't need to have good credit or a credit card to, to invest, um, that rings true. Now you can get started with uh, investing on like a micro investing platform, which is setting up an account and, and linking it to uh, like your debit card or something. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, the question is because in some cases people are maybe just, look, their income is so low that they just haven't decided that they need a credit card in their life. Oh, um, the but, income but as, being low. As, as you've talked, uh, you know, if you are low income and you invest if you are low income. Yeah, I mean, I think with that being in low income, you know, uh, and not having money, it's like, that's the last thing on your mind, right? It's like, I don't have enough money to pay my bills or for the day in day how can i even invest i think it's it is hard but i i think just starting with five dollars a month even i think is a good way for them to start and just to kind of um encourage them to be like you know it seems kind of counterintuitive but like the negative pull of not having enough for these things if you can afford five bucks a week or a month that positive pull meaning i'm doing something for my future I think psychologically can make a difference. And then when they're in a better place uh, to invest, like they to invest more, to invest more uh, consistently, I think they'll have, as John mentioned, the framework, right? The infrastructure, the path to to really focus on it. So that's what I would suggest, you know, um, maybe it's not conventional advice, but that's what I would suggest doing. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense to me as well. I, I Yeah, the credit card, or the the lack of a credit card in and of itself is not a problem. It might actually be beneficial, right? If you avoid paying uh, high interest uh, debt, I think people are talking about in the 20s and even 30s uh, interest rate being charged on those. So, you know, to the extent it is 
just a you know sort of an element of a of a difficult financial picture overall, then I I, I think that's a, a great perspective to to start small, um, to see if you can build up savings and um, maybe take advantage of some of the other uh, frameworks that that Jackie and I talked about. Um, but the credit card itself is um, you know not not necessary for investing and it can even be detrimental. I I, I did you know mention some of the risks with uh, or the things to consider with um, you know, investing platforms or apps. But one of the things that's really can be very beneficial, uh, as, as we keep mentioning, is that the barriers to entry in terms of minimums and in terms of fees, right, are much lower now than the, than they have been uh, in the past. And, and that can be a uh, an important uh, tool to getting started. Great, thank you, John. Uh, can can you talk about the role of home ownership compared with stock market investing in terms of forming wealth? Uh, where should priorities be? Yeah, maybe maybe I'll I'll just start. So um, you know, I, I think they're both important things to consider. Um, you know, a, a, there, there's lots of, of data out there about the the value of a primary residence as a wealth generator and as as an asset that is you know potentially more likely than other assets to be passed down to future generations um over long periods of time there's also some data that that you know broad-based uh you know index funds might might outperform uh residences it, it depends uh, on all kinds of factors um ideally it's sort of a both and as opposed to an, an either or um, I would just mention too. I'm looking at some data here from the the Federal Reserve about um, you know the the wealth gap vis-a-vis -vis, uh, primary residence ownership versus um, you know re retirement accounts, and and so I'm seeing here that it looks like you know we've we've also posted this data on the, the SEC Twitter account over time. Something like um, just over 40% of middle-aged households, black households, have uh, retirement. Um, or, or so, excuse me, under uh, 40% of middle-aged uh, black households have a retirement accounts a little bit more than that on their, their primary residence, but these are way behind, uh, you know, way lower than the, the data that you would see for uh, for white households, for example. Uh, so, so I think both can be really powerful. There's some incentives to both, but um, I, I guess maybe just one thing to keep in mind is that getting started saving and investing, there can be lower barriers to entry and uh as compared to home ownership but they can also be powerful tools in achieving home ownership right if you're putting aside funds um you know sort of risk adjusted and, and timeline adjusted that are appropriate for you they can can help you achieve uh the goal of of, of home ownership maybe jackie you have a, a perspective on how to think about those two yeah that's great points you raised john i think with that question which we hear a lot right is like how does home ownership play into it i think uh, it's also just like a symbolic uh the, the symbolism that a home represents right might also be something that is not necessarily about building wealth or investing but something that a lot of people do consider and um because uh, investing in a home or purchasing a home requires like you said so much of a upfront uh investment right there's so much money that you need for down payment for all the closing costs versus you know investing where you can these days you said there's lower uh, fees minimums and all that stuff and it is kind of a both and it, it depends on like you said different factors of where you're at um where you live even uh if you want to pass it on to your your heirs and i was told there's like REITs is it REITs r-e-i-t-s which is a type of investment which is geared toward investing in real real estate uh, which i know isn't the same but that is an, an alternative to investing buying a home versus having your some investments in real estate in the real estate market and just just one other point on that those are those are, are great points the um cfpb the consumer financial protection bureau um which is at consumerfinance.gov has a site on Buying a house, so they have a site. It's called uh, Buying a House: Tools and Resources for Home Buyers, right? So it covers things to think about, including um, avoiding scams that can be um, that and that that can be prevalent during the the home purchasing process, but also 
goes through what you need to think about as you as you as you get started. So again, lots of resources out there for for your clients. Thank you. And then um, do do either of you know of any resources for assisting? Someone's asking that there's a challenge uh, when they're working with the Islamic and Muslim populations related to the prohibition against earning or paying interest. Uh, if you not sure if you have any resources. I don't know if sometimes the local credit union sometimes have figured a way around that. Have, have, have you heard of the issue? Do you have any resources? If there's anything you can send me later today, I'm happy to include it in, in materials I send out tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, That's a, it's a great question. I don't, I don't think I have a, a, a great response for that one either. Okay. Okay, well, if we find something, we, we'll share it. Um, we'll share it when we get it. Um, <clears throat> someone is asking for clarification. John, if somebody wants a someone from, from SEC to come out and put on a community training, are you able to do that? Uh, the answer is yes, right? So we, uh, you know, if, if it's, you know, community-based, if it's focused on, you know, supporting the general, investing public individual investors then then uh we'd be very happy to talk about it with you and you can connect with us at outreach at sec.gov but we can do remote events like this or in person either with folks from our, our uh, main office in washington dc or one of our uh, 11 regional offices around the country so we go to schools military bases community organizations um, so yes is the answer outreach at sec.gov Great, thank you. Uh, and then we have a question about uh, when we were talking about rebalancing um, our target date funds, a good option, especially for rebalancing. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question about? Are, are, are target date funds a good option, especially for rebalancing purposes? Mm -hmm. Um, off the top of my head, I think they do the rebalancing for you with the target date funds, but I could be wrong. That makes sense. But maybe John. Yeah, that's the that that uh, that that's right, Jackie. So the 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 concept behind a, a target date fund in general <laughs> is that it will shift the asset allocation, which which Jackie was talking about, right? So the mix of of different asset types like stocks and bonds and, and maybe cash or other other assets over time. So generally, the way that, that people think about it and the way that the funds operate, again, generally, is that they might shift to a more conservative asset allocation as you get older, closer to retirement, when you might want a, um, a less volatile portfolio or a portfolio which, on average, has been less volatile. Similarly, for um, a 529 or college savings account, there might be ones that are, the date is not your target retirement date, but your target school date where it might get uh, less, it might be more uh, aggressive with a, a higher risk, but higher expected return um, when the, the child is younger and then less uh, shift to a less aggressive, ideally uh, or theoretically less uh, volatile asset allocation as they get closer to college and then um, something closer to cash or short-term treasuries or something like that once they're in college so that you have less volatility when you when you need the the, the, the funds to pay the tuition in that example um, again that's just a general way to approach it you need to to look into the specifics of the fund that you were looking at you can can plug in the fund on investor.gov and there's other resources as well to understand the fees um, definitely do your research but yes that's the that's the basic idea is that they would shift their asset allocation over time automatically um, as um, as you age. Yeah, I think that's yeah. I think that's why they're known to have. They can they can be higher fees because of that, right? Because of the work they're doing for you, so you don't have to uh, do all that shifting. So it's more conservative over closer to the target date. Uh, absolutely, you're often charged for that. You should double check the fees and make sure that they um, you know, match your match your needs and and you know that you find it worth it. Thank you. Yes, definitely do some comparison shopping there, right? Uh, we do have a few people are, you know, people are looking at the headlines. Everything's all all about the debt ceiling and 
all basically that a few people are concerned about that how much should we be paying attention to those headlines and how do they impact our decisions about investing right now how should they impact our, our decisions So, so I don't have a, a comment specifically on, on that topic, um, but I do think it's a good reminder to make sure that you have asset an asset allocation for yourself that matches both your risk tolerance, and, and I think that, that Jackie did a good job describing this, like you need to have asset allocation, right? So an investment portfolio that matches both your risk tolerance, right? So how much volatility are you willing to experience how much of your portfolio are you willing to see go to zero, if any, right? And then um, uh, also your time horizon, right? So your risk your risk tolerance might change, as we're just describing about retirement or, or college, might change over time. And so I think this is not a comment with respect to the specific point that, that you raised, uh, but just in general, these kinds of things are a really good reminder to make sure that you have the right asset allocation, the right portfolio that, that makes sense uh, for you and for your needs, your perspective, um, and very specifically for your risk tolerance and your time horizon. And just to add to that, uh, what John mentioned, uh, you know, all those things to keep in mind is just, there's a lot of headlines that we can follow and that can create concern or want us to like dramatically change our strategy, but John mentioned, me keeping in line the main things like your risk tolerance, your time horizon, uh, anything that's changing with your goals is really the things to consider. And also to, as mentioned, it's it's time in the market. So to be consistent in, in that and to like, yeah, to look at your asset allocation over time. And, you know, it's, it is, it's to kind of look at those um, headlines and know these things are happening, but like also investing, you know, it's, it, can be for the long haul, right? It can be for the ultimate goals that we want to hit, uh, which makes it a little bit of a different beast than uh, things that I feel like, quote unquote, seem more straightforward, right? Like saving, that seems pretty straightforward. Uh, even you know, insurance is straightforward, but yeah, investing is a whole nother animal. So like maybe sometimes looking at those and being like, okay, like that's a little alarming, but you know, how much should I, have how much of that news that headline impact my decisions uh because i want long term for my money to grow and this is what i need to remember to keep my you know in inner investment compass on track so to speak great thank you then somebody's asking if you could or maybe i guess considering hiring help or getting help if somebody is a fiduciary yeah, how reliable is that term? Can you can you rely on someone telling you that and then trusting them? Uh, yeah, uh, fiduciary. I believe it means uh, okay. So there's, I think there's like a standard that's like suitable standard, right, John? And then there's the fiduciary standard. A fiduciary means that they. So the suitable standard, I believe, in investing in the vesting world is that they uh, need to do what this investment or financial professional needs to give you advice, recommendations, um, you know, suggestions on products based on what is suitable for your goals, your risk tolerance, your you know whatever your your preferences, blah, and et cetera. But the fiduciary, I think they they need to put your interests first which sounds kind of com complicated, but I think uh, as far as I know, fiduciary is meaning they need to have your be best interests at heart. And and, and, and from what I know, it's, it is something that you can trust. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think that's a, a, a fine way to put it. I, maybe I would just refer folks to um, the, the topic of, there, there's some information on investor.gov about fiduciaries. And there's a description of regulation best interest, um, which which goes into some detail of things that you might want to think about. Um, I guess I would say, regardless of um, whether the person that you're dealing with is a, is a fiduciary that that should subordinate your uh, needs and goals to their uh, their preferences, you should check out uh, any investment professional on investor.gov. 
see if they are, again, licensed registered. If not, you might want to understand why. Um, and if there is any negative information there, um, make, make sure that you are comfortable dealing with, with that uh, person or institution. Great, thank you. And then just a couple more questions since we are running out of time. As, do you have anything more to say about celebrity endorsements? A couple of folks are you know, talking about things like the FTX investment platform and other celebrity endorsements. Um, you should be cautious about these things. And are there any other tips on this that you can offer? Um, yeah, I think definitely uh, heed caution with celebrity endorsements uh, because just because obviously they're celebrity doesn't mean they are investment professional. Uh, just kind of like how celebrities uh, obviously are known to like start and end fads, whether it's money. Like I know there's a lot of celebrities who are, have been endorsing different things in crypto, NFTs, and all that. I think just like anything else, to remember they even though there's hype around it to just remember to check and do your own research and homework, no matter who it is, it could be a huge celebrity like Gwyneth Paltrow, right? Or it could be someone you see on Instagram or TikTok to just do your homework and to be cautious and to just double check what they're saying. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We, maybe not surprisingly at this point, we have an investor alert on this topic. Uh, so you can just search, um, on investor.gov, you can put in celebrity. Um, so there's an investor alert, so maybe I'll just quote from uh, one section of that, which says, it's never a good idea to make an inv investment decision just because someone famous says that a product or service is a good investment. And so remember, even if the uh, celebrity endorsement and even if the investment opportunity are genuine, it might not be, um, it doesn't mean that it's right for you, right? So. Um, there's a lot of things to consider when investing and, and probably making sure that you understand it, that it comports with um, everything that, that, that Jack and I have been describing about risk tolerance and, and time horizon. Um, those things are probably more important, uh, but, but check out that investor alert for a, a little bit more on, on that topic. Yeah, I think it's just like any diet fad, like one minute you hear like, no, eat nothing but meat. And the next minute you hear, you know, eat nothing but carrots, right? It's it's kind of, and it's just because someone famous, as John mentioned, is telling you to eat nothing but carrots or nothing but meat or whatever. And, and it's like, you have to like, remember like the basics, like, you know, and whatever is important and wh whatever you know to be true. Because yeah, just because that, that hype is, it's really, it can be just white noise. Great, thank you. Uh, any any final tips uh, on how to get this get this information out into the community? Someone's asking you, like, how do you how do you get this out? How do you tell people how to access all this information? Any other final thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, just just something to keep in mind that that as you support your community uh, and your end um, you know, clients in various ways, not everybody wants to talk about investing um, as a standalone topic. People think about this often sort of as, as part of the, the, the fabric of their lives, of their goals. And so we think about attending events and reaching people sort of through adjacencies, right? So maybe people are attending an event about how to pay for college or about how to buy a home, which, which was brought up earlier. Um, about how to improve their resume or any of these different types of topics. All those people are thinking about their future and savings, uh, saving wisely, investing wisely should probably be part of that future. And so maybe thinking, my, my suggestion is to think about reaching people who are open to this message um, and, and uh, even if they wouldn't go to an event solely about it. So I'll throw that one out there. Yeah. Um, and also just to add to what John mentioned, which is like integrating investing advice into, yeah, the topic that has more like large, big, uh, big picture goals is maybe to consider niching based on um, community, right? So if you want to do a seminar on investing, maybe for communities that don't are maybe afraid to talk freely 
or to even ask for advice or help in um you know in a larger uh, with everyone i think that's maybe why certain platforms and people and financial people exist because there are when there are like groups just for women for investing people of color and in investing so that might be something to consider based on your clients and your communities to kind of niche and kind of create a sub group or a sub a workshop or presentation for for that community great thank you thank you jackie and, and john really quick do you have for people who can give presentations in other than english uh we we do um so uh especially in in spanish we can do that and if you have another language um let us know another language request let us know and we can see if we have uh the resources to support it great so and then i'll remind thank you Sorry. john and i'll remind everyone that the that the fact sheets that linda pointed out earlier are in in five different languages uh and also just like uh, you got some kudos here uh jackie people love your visual needs and wants um uh powerpoint and then uh going oh no that was john your needs and wants and then jackie um they liked your slides where you really broke down the difference between index funds mutual funds stocks etc so people are eager to get these slides and we're planning to send them out tomorrow and then i also will include a link to the video that john mentioned in the slides it's also included in our resource sheet it's a fantastic video. It's short. It won't disappoint. Uh, you want to check it out. It will help avoid scams. Thank you, Linda. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nelson. And thank you again, uh, John and uh, Jackie. Thank you so much. And again, a special thanks to NASDAQ, our sponsor uh, for this event. Thank you uh, for your support. Uh, if you would like to contribute to Consumer Action, you can do so online by credit card or PayPal by going to www, our website, www.consumer-action.org slash giving, or you can mail us a check to Consumer Action Attention Membership Giving, 57 Post Street, Suite 611, San Francisco, California, 94104. Don't have a check? No worries, you can still support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It's free and it would help us continue bringing you these uh, great webinars. Again, a special thanks to our guest speaker. Thank you so much for those uh, excellent presentations. Audience, I can't wait to hear what you think about today's webinar. So please remember to complete the survey. We value your feedback as we strive to bring you timely, relevant information that will make a difference in, in the lives of the consumers you serve. Thank you for joining us and submitting your questions, keeping it going. A link to today's recording will be released tomorrow, so watch your uh, box. That's all we have for you today. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for your service. Don't forget to follow us on social media and have a great rest of your day. Bye.